Now that we've installed and started up Unreal, uh, we're going to make our first project. And this project is going to be based on the third person template. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, I'm going to call it tutorials because that's what I'm doing here. And you're going to want to stick with blueprints probably. Uh, this is what you're going to be using for programming, either blueprint visual scripting or C++. We're going to stick with blueprint because it's easier. Target platform can be whatever you want. We're going to stick with desktop, uh, quality preset, maximum or scalable. Let's just keep all this at maximum. Starter content enabled, ray tracing. Doesn't really matter what we do with that. So I'm going to keep that disabled and then we can create our new projects. And when the project finally opens up, you will see a little something like this. The way you will navigate around a map like this is holding down the right click button and then just using WASD to move around. You can also pan up, down, left and right by holding the middle mouse button. And between the two of those, you should be able to more or less move around however you need to move around to design your levels. But before we can design levels, we're going to need to make a lot of little things. So let's take a look at how Unreal actually works. If we go over to the right hand side here, you will see the outliner. This is all of the actors that are present in this particular level. A actor is anything that you place into your map. So this thing over here, this is an actor. This thing over here, which is where your player character will spawn, is also an actor. This text over here, also an actor. Any object you're seeing right here on screen is referred to as an actor. There's multiple different types of actors. And if we press control space, we can see our folder structure here. So uh, this is where we will be able to make our new own assets. We've got our starter content here, which Unreal uh, is very nice in giving us things like some animations that a project starts up with and then we also have uh, some skeletal meshes. These are pre-made things that you can use for like prototyping and testing stuff before you start making the actual visuals for yourself. We're going to throw away most of this because we're not going to be using any of this in our final game. So I'm just going to go select everything from the outliner and press the delete key to delete things out of existence. Which leaves us with a couple of lighting related things over on this side of the screen. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's a tiny bit beyond the basics that we're going to be talking about here. But if you look at the left hand side here, there's a tab that says place actors. So if we click on that, we can choose the type of actor that we want. Uh, but more importantly, we have basic, which is actor, character, pawn. We'll get to that in a moment. These are specific types of actors that obviously do lighting stuff so we've got a spotlight and a point light and again that's an entirely separate tutorial series uh the lighting systems in unreal we've got shapes these are just some basic shapes like a cube like a sphere cylinder cone plane you get the point you've got some cinematic stuff which is not relevant for what we're doing right here some visual effects stuff post-processing volume sky atmospheres volumetrics all much more advanced again than what we're talking about right now we've got geometry these are similar to the shapes but these can actually be edited and changed around a lot easier so these are the ones that we'll be using so we're going to just drag in a box and we're going to delete the two shapes that we've made before then if you come over to the right hand side again we have a details panel this is where all the information about the currently selected actor can be found so we have the surface material we have the geometry information but we also have and that's what we're going to be talking about right now the transform information so at the moment its location is minus 820 in the x direction positive 3430 in the y direction and positive 1830 in the Z direction. So let's set all of this to zero. And now this thing is set exactly to zero, zero, zero. That's usually a good point to work off of. As you can see, all of the other things like the skyline and stuff like that are also set up at the uh, zero, zero location in the world. So let's drag out our start player. And as you can see, it's really difficult to actually properly position things sometimes. So what you want to do, details, is just put this at zero, zero. 
and then the Z direction is literally just how high up it is. So if we start a game now, we, we can press this little button over here, playtest this level, and the game will run in our viewport window. And we'll be able to see that we spawn on top of the block that we just placed. And the template comes with some basic input controls so we can walk around and this is starting to look a bit like a game. So let's go back to the geometry and if we have that selected and we go up here to select mode and we go into brush editing or by pressing shift 7 we can suddenly start selecting individual sides of this cube and dragging them around and now the cube is a lot wider and if we go back into the gameplay we can walk down it and this is of course how we're going to be making our 2D platformer level. Now, before we end off today, we're going to actually make a actor of our own. So what we do is pressing control and space, bring up this menu again. And in the content folder, I'm going to make a new folder and that's going to be called BPS. That stands for blueprints. In that, I'm going to right click and make a new blueprint class. Here you can see there's a couple of different uh, common types and there's a lot more uncommon types. For the time being, we're going to stick to just the common ones. We've got actors, which again, an actor is literally any objects within the game world. We've got pawns. These are specific types of actors that can be possessed by either a player controller, which we'll talk about later, or a AI controller, which does the same thing as a player controller, which is giving a specific actor instructions. But rather than the player doing it, it's an AI doing it. A character is a pawn with a little bit of extra information to it. It's got a movement component, so it can move around on its own. Uh, it can be told how fast it can move, what kind of surfaces it can walk up on, that kind of stuff. So anything that needs to be walking around, for instance, is probably going to want to be a character. Then you've got a player controller, which can give instructions to a pawn or a character. In a lot of situations, you could very much skip using player controllers altogether and just put all your programming inside of the actor that you're going to be using. It's slightly bad form to do that, but for the time being, uh, we're going to just skip over player controllers because while it's a very useful and powerful tool, it can also be a tad bit confusing to get started with. We've got a game mode base, which is kind of similar to a player controller in a lot of ways, but instead of giving instructions and information to a specific actor that is being controlled by the player, it's giving instructions and information for a specific level. Game mode can generally be a very easy way to transfer information from one actor to another without having a direct link between the two actors. It's a bit of a cheat to do it that way and not terribly efficient, but it's a very good way to do things. And I'm sure that throughout the tutorial series, we're definitely going to run into that. Now we've got actor component, which is a component that you can put within an actor. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And a scene component, which is not that relevant for what we're doing right now. So with that all explained, I want to reiterate one thing, right? Because this player controller and game mode base, they aren't actors but characters and pawns are. This is kind of like a hierarchy, right? So a character is always a pawn and a pawn is always an actor, which is important to understand because it means that anything a pawn can do, a character can do because a character builds on top of what a pawn already does. For the time being, we're going to just make a coin so we can select normal actor because it doesn't need to move it doesn't need to really do anything it only needs to be able to be picked up so we can make this call it coin double click to open it and we get a new window here. we can drag this up top to make it go full screen so here we have the components remember what we just talked about being able to make an actor component that would go in here Unreal comes with a bunch of different types of actor components by default and by and large that's probably going to be fine. You're probably not going to have to make your own, but you can. So you can add a lot of different things. One of the more common things that you're going to add are going to be either skeletal meshes or static meshes. In this case, let's go for a static mesh. Skeletal meshes are meshes that you can animate. Static meshes are meshes that don't animate and just remain the same. 
and we can call it coin because we're going to add a mesh for a coin and here on static mesh we can select the mesh that we want unreal again with the starter content has a lot of meshes already built in so let's try to make a thing that looks like a coin you know what we can just use the materials view for that right it's it's round it's uh pretty much all we need and then we can scale it down a bit or up a bit but as you see it only scales it in one direction if i just scroll over it and that is because ctrl z to undo it's not locked in so if i press this button over here it locks all these three axes together and i can just make the entire thing proportionally smaller but this doesn't look like a coin does it it uh it looks like a uh, very much a testing texture because it is so what we'll do is again by pressing Control spacebar we can in our content folder make yet another folder and call it materials and if we go into that and right click we can make a new material we'll call that a uh, coin as well and if we double click that we will open up the material editor how do we actually hook things up into here well you can use image textures so if you just drag in an image you can connect that up to these pins over here but i don't have any image textures right now what i want to do is i just want to make this gold because we're making a coin so what i can do is while holding three on the keyboard left clicking that gets me a vector three parameter this is a output pin here that has three values an x value a y value and a z value so if i open up this here which has constant i will get rgb which rgb and xyz uh, are kind of equivalent in this case because we're in a material editor they're called rgb so i can start fooling around with this and you can see as i increase the r value things get red and then when i increase the g value things go green when i increase the b value things go blue but how do we make gold out of red blue and green well you could start learning okay if i increase green and red together that makes yellow but that requires quite a bit of patience and just straight up experience which you might not want to invest any time into because you just want to be able to get started with making your game well luckily if you have vector 3 and you just double click you get a color wheel here and you can just simply drag this to the yellow part then drag this up into being brighter and then it'll be yellow we can plug that into the base color and as you can see now this thing is fully yellow but how do we make it more metallic because it's supposed to be gold right so in much the same way that we did for making a vector 3 parameter remember that's what this is we can make just a single parameter which you can do by holding down one and just left clicking that just gets you a, a little node which has one value in it which we're going to set to one and then hook up into the metallic pin over here and you will see suddenly this thing is a bit more metallic now we can copy this node and paste it so we have a second one and then we can hook that up into the roughness so we can see because it's set to roughness one this thing is very non-reflective if i set it to roughness zero it'll suddenly be very reflective by default if you don't set anything into it it'll be in the middle at 0.5 which is what we had just a moment ago that's what this is honestly i think this is not quite reflective enough so we're gonna go down to like 0.2 maybe 0.2 seems pretty good let's maybe 0.3 it's a little bit of experimentation right and this is this this is something i like so we can apply that and now we have this material so going back to our coin actor that we've made we can go here in the properties under material we can now select the coin material we made and now our little sphere has a golden material we can press compile and then when we go back into our map here we change from brush editing mode back to selecting mode then pressing ctrl and space going back to our blueprints we can start dragging these coins into the level and a very neat little thing you can do is if you hold alt while dragging into a certain direction it'll just copy the actor over so holding alt i can make a bunch of these coins they're not very spread out well but 
we now have a bunch of coins. But the thing is, right, if we now try to pick them up, we can't. We, we can just run into them and that doesn't do anything. Well, that's something that we're going to be talking about next time. But before we do that, we're making a 2D platformer, aren't we? This is not very 2D, this is very 3D. So before we end off, let's add a camera. Because the camera that exists in our default character is definitely not what we want to be using. So what we can do is we can go place actor and then all classes and we can look up a camera. You have cameras and cinematic cameras. We want normal cameras in this case. So we can just set one down and you will see the camera view over here in the bottom right corner. So we can set them down there and then set them something like that. And then when we start playing, we don't see that camera view at all. By default, it will choose to use the camera that's attached to your player character. So we'll have to tell the engine that we want to use this camera specifically. Well, how do we do that? Well, coming up here, we can go to open level blueprint. And this is an event graph, which every actor in the game is going to have an event graph like this. But also every level has an event graph. This is where you'll end up doing all of the scripting for every single object in the game. But every single level might also have unique interactions. So what you can do is while you have the camera actor selected in the level editor itself, you can right click and create reference to camera actor. Now you have a node over here that represents that specific camera. But we can't really do too much with that. So what we'll want to do is we'll want to add an event. And the way you can add an event is just by typing here. And we want a begin play event. This event runs the instant the game starts up. There's a lot of different types of events and you can make your own custom event that you can call whenever you want. Begin play is a very often used event. Now to tell the game that we want to use this camera, we can right click and set view target. Contact sensitive is on, so it doesn't really realize what we're trying to do. And usually it hides everything that isn't relevant to what the engine thinks we're trying to script here. But sometimes it messes up. So if you're looking for a specific node that you know exists, but it doesn't show up here, you turn off contact sensitive, and suddenly we have set view target with blend, which is the node I was looking for. So I can just click on that and I'll add one. I can hook up this little arrow to that arrow. And now we have a couple of pins here. So target self is a player controller object reference, which we don't have yet. So let's skip that for the moment. And now we have a new view target, which is an actor object reference. Hey, the camera we just had is an actor object. So we'll see that if I start dragging off this node, it'll only highlight the actual pins that it can go into. So we'll hook this up into here so this is now telling the game at begin play set the camera as your new view target which means that this is going to be the camera used to render the game but since unreal is very much an engine that focuses on being multiplayer compatible we have to actually tell the game which specific player that will count for so we can right click again and get player controller then we get this node over here with player index zero, and we hook that up into the player controller here. These parameters over here you can just leave alone for the time being. So when we compile this and we go back, you will see that the game starts up from that camera perspective, but it doesn't move, which is a bit too bad because that really limits what you can do making levels, doesn't it? Let's talk about scripting. In the last two videos, we talked a lot about the actual interface of Unreal, where to find things, how things work. Today, we're going to get into the actual thing that makes a game a game, that being the functionality. So as you might recall, in the last video, we added this camera and these coins, but neither of them at the moment have functionality. And that is exactly what we're going to be taking care of today. So first things first, if you recall, up here, we can open the level blueprint and that is where we set the view target with blend with the event begin play 
event. That was a little sneak peek into scripting we talked about last episode. Today, we're going to be talking about a different event, that being Event Tick. This is an event that will automatically run every frame of the game. So if the game runs at 60 FPS, this event will run 60 times per second. This means that if you make things happen in Event Tick, they will happen faster or slower depending on the frame rate of the game, speeding up or slowing down. For now though, we're going to just use it to move the camera actor, which we made a reference to last episode. We can just copy paste that along with how the player moves. We can get player character, which is an object's reference to whatever character the player is controlling. Important here, remember the things we talked about last time with actors, pawns and characters? This can only be a character. If it's just a pawn or just an actor, this is not going to work. Dragging up this player character, we can get the world location of the capsule component. And then if we right click on this yellow pin, we can split the structure pin into an X, a Y and a Z value. We don't want it to be exactly at the same location as the player character. We just want it to move along some of the same axes. Now, dragging off the camera actor, we can set the world location of the camera component. But now how do we decide where to put the camera? Because we want to have the camera move along with the player. So we have the player location, we have the camera location, but we can't just plug this into here because at that point it would just be at the exact same spot as the player and you wouldn't be able to see anything. So you want a offset between the player character and the camera. To do this, we're going to make use of a variable. A variable is like a little box in which you can put some information. And then the game can point to that box and just say, use whatever information is in that box. And you can change that information around. So instead of saying one plus one equals two, you could say variable A plus variable B equals variable C. And then you could just by default say A and B are both equal to one and you'll just still have one plus one equals two. But now say in a slightly different situation, you want to add four and six. Instead of making an entirely new calculation there, you can just use those variables, change the value of them, and the same calculation can happen again. Now, we're going to do something similar, but instead of just adding two numbers together, we're going to use that to add two vectors together. A vector is a variable that holds three pieces of information, an X value, a Y value, and a Z value. There's a couple of variable types that you'll end up using a lot. So let's go over those real quick. We have Boolean variables. These can hold information that's just yes or no. These are very useful if the computer needs to run one piece of code if one condition is true and another piece of code if another condition is true, or to track if a player has a certain key picked up, for instance. Then there's integers. These are whole numbers. So think one, two, three, four, five, six, etc., etc. There's not much more to it than that. Things like your score will probably be stored inside of an integer. After the integer, we have the float variable. Floats are much like integers, but they have compatibility with decimal places. So you're not just limited to using one, two, three, four, five, six. You can say 1.4 or 1.6 or 2.8 or 6.7 or whatever you want. And you're not just limited to one decimal place either. You can go very, very precise with these. A string variable holds some text. Think things like a player name, maybe, that the player can input, or the name of an item, something like that. Finally, we get to the vector variable. A vector variable can be thought of as three floats stored in a single variable. You've got an X value, a Y value, and a Z value. Things like three-dimensional position are stored in vector variables, because you need an X position, a Y position, and a Z position to know where a certain object is. The same thing goes for rotation. You need a X rotation, a Y rotation, and a Z rotation to know exactly how a object is rotated. So with that explanation out of the way, let's make our first vector variable. We can go over in this menu over here, press the little plus button with variable, and we get a new variable. We can call it whatever we want. And since this is going to be the offset between the character and the camera, we'll call it 
camera delta location. Right now though, this is a boolean. And if you paid attention to the explanation I just gave, that's not going to store the kind of information that we need. So coming over to the right side of the screen here, we can go down in variable type and we can set it to being a vector. Now, if we compile this, we can see the default value has three fields, a X value, a Y value, and a Z value. If we hold Alt while dragging this into the event graph, we'll get a node which we can use to set the value of this variable. Now, let's copy over the player character and the camera actor. You can select multiple nodes by holding Shift while selecting them. Paste them over here, and again, get world location for the capsule components. And for the camera actor, we'll also get the world location for the camera components. Now, if we drag off the get world location for the camera, and we just type in minus, we get a subtract operator. So now we can subtract another vector from this world location. So if we subtract the player character's position from the camera actor position, we'll know the offset between these two actors. We can then plug that into this node over here, the camera delta, and if we connect it up to set view target with blend, which is connected up to the event begin play, at event begin play, this variable will now be given its proper value. So what will happen is we'll start up the game, we'll set the view target with blend, and then this variable will get set. Now, you're going to want to make things a little bit more readable, because obviously, uh, working with nodes, things can get very spaghetti-like very, very quickly. So do be aware that things need to be somewhat readable, because if you're going to come back to this in like a month, you're not going to be able to tell whatever is going on if you don't make things a little bit more clear to read. So just order your nodes somewhere like this so that you can actually read what's going on. Now, back in the event tick, we can drag in the camera data location while holding control to get a reference to it. Before we used alt to get a node that would set its value, if you hold control, you will get a node that will get the value. We can then drag off this and type in a plus. We'll get a add operator, which is very similar to the subtraction we just did here. And if we go back to the example map here, we only really care about the up direction and this green direction over here. The up direction, the blue, is Z, and the green direction is always Y. So we don't really care about the X direction at all because we're playing in 2D. So just like we did with this node over here, we can right click this and split structure pin, X value and the Z value into the X and Z respectively. Let's move around these nodes a little bit so that they're easier to read. And then we can use the output of that to set a new world location. And that we will do every game tick. So what's happening every game tick is we're getting the Y and the Z location for the player, which is the side to side and the up and down directions. We're adding the camera data location, which is the camera offset, to that and then we're using that to set it at that new location so that if we now go into the third person example map you will see that the camera is now following us along and even if we jump the camera also goes up but going towards and away from the camera which is something that we're going to need to get rid of soon anyway uh, the camera doesn't actually follow us because we didn't hook up the x value there now, let's add something a little more functionality here, because we also got some coins that aren't doing anything. So if we go into the outliner here on the right hand side, we see these coins and we can add it coin. We can also press Ctrl and space and find the coin blueprint in our content form. So let's open up the coin blueprint here and we'll see a couple of events again. Event begin play, which runs at the start of the game. We've got event which we just talked about which runs every single frame neither of those we care about at the moment so we're going to delete those and we've also got event actor begin overlap which sounds a lot more intimidating but it really isn't all this does is it checks whether or not a actor is overlapping with this actor so the player character is an actor which could overlap with this coin the moment something overlaps with it this event is triggered there's one issue though because we're never going to actually overlap since this thing is solid and overlapping means that being inside of the actor 
Luckily, there is a very easy fix for that. We can add a component and uh, just add a sphere collision. And if we go back to the viewport here, we can now see there's a sphere around the coin. We can scale it up or down, depending on what we need. Now, when we enter this sphere, this event will trigger. A very useful node to have is the print string node. This is something that you use for debugging a lot. And we're using it here to show you that now we do have a uh, overlap event. So whenever I start touching it, look at the top left of the screen. There will be a blue hello appearing. And there we go, it's a blue hello. But if we now delete the sphere again, we don't have a collision uh, sphere anymore. There's nothing to overlap because we only have a collision, which getting a little technical here is called a hit. There's also an event for that, but in general, for picking up things, for most things that you're going to do, you're going to want to use overlap events and not hit events because hit events have a lot more data associated with them and are as such a little less optimized. So I've added the sphere back in and now we're going to need to make some things happen. We have our third person character blueprint, which is the character that we've been playing as. So let's open that one up as well. This has uh, all of the input information in it, as well as uh, the camera here, which we can actually just delete because we're not going to use that camera ever. Which also means we can delete the camera input for the mouse because that's not going to be relevant either. And we don't need the move left or right either. That might seem counterintuitive because we're only going to be moving left and right, but this is talking from the perspective of the actor itself. And moving left and right would mean moving towards or away from a camera. So we can delete that as well. And this is more camera input, so we can delete that as well. And that leaves us with only the jumping and the walking back and forward. So now that we have that cleaned up, let's talk about a score system. So just like we did before, we're going to make a variable and we're going to call this variable score. This variable is going to be an integer. Remember, integers are whole numbers. For a score variable, we don't really need decimal places, so it's better to use integers. And we're going to compile and save this. But now, how do we change this score variable from the coin? Because if we go to the coin, it's it's not there, right? We, we don't have the score variable anymore. Well, at actor begin overlap, which is what happens when we run into the coin, we're going to uh, cast. And casting is a way to either read or write information to another actor. So we're going to cast to third person character, which is the blueprint we just talked about. But we need an object reference for that, because this is only casting to the blueprint, which is what it sounds like. It's the blueprint. It's not the actual object within the world. It's only the instructions to make that object. So we're casting to a certain type of object, but not an object specifically. And in the case for a player character, that might sound a bit weird, like, okay, but there's only going to be one player character. But you can cast to any blueprint in the game. Imagine we do it the other way around, right? We run into a coin and we want to tell something to that coin, maybe to change color or something like that. The game needs to know which specific coin we're talking about. If we're just casting to blueprint coin, that could be any coin in the entire level. So you need an object reference. Luckily, the object reference we can just get from other actor. This has two functions. Number one, it functions as the object reference, but this also works as a check whether or not the thing running into the coin is actually the player we want to check for. Because if it's not, the cast will fail and whatever we hook up to this bottom pin will happen. But if it is the player character, any code that we hook up into the top pin will happen. We can drag over this blue pin over here and we can get the score variable. See, now that we have the score variable from this blueprint inside of the coin, we can actually do something with it. So if we drag off that and we just type plus plus, we'll get an increment int. This just simply adds one to whatever integer we put into it. So now when we run into a coin, we will get one score point, but we number one can't see that. And number two, the coins won't disappear. Luckily, making the coins disappear is actually really easy. We can just drag off this and uh, type in destroy and we get a destroy actor node. If you don't hook anything up into it, you can see it has the reference for self. So now 
when something walks into this actor, it will cast to the third person character. If that cast is successful, it will get the score variable in that character, incremented by one, and then destroy the coin itself. So we can check that. And as you can see, it works. What you can't see, however, is the score. So remember what we did before with the print string. For the time being, we're going to keep it at that. In a later tutorial, we'll talk about making a UI and displaying the score and maybe even something like player health. So we can just print the string and we can put anything into this print string we want. You might say, but this is a teal turquoise blue color and this is, this is pink. That doesn't make any sense. Luckily, Unreal is very nice to us and will automatically put a conversion node in between. So now every time this runs, we will see the score on the top left corner here increase. So now we have one, we have two, three, four, five, and six. And that's been the basic introduction to scripting and variables in the Unreal Engine. It's a lot to wrap your head around at first, especially the whole casting thing. It took me a little while to realize really what was going on there. I encourage you to, with the information you got in this video, before moving on to the next one, try making something on your own. Something that decreases the health of your player character when it comes in contact with it. And then in the next video, we're going to talk about the UI and how to use these variables inside of a overlay for your screen to actually see what's going on. And actually let the player know what their health and their current score count is. So now that we have a basic understanding of how we can make scripts, let's talk about how we can actually display things on the screen. Because right now, if we play the game, we'll see that we we can pick up coins and that's all good and fine but we can't actually see what kind of like score or our money count or hp count or whatever so let's get into that the first thing you're going to do in your content browser is you're going to in a separate folder it doesn't have to be a separate folder but it's good to be tidy we're going to make a widget blueprint so in that folder we go user interface widget blueprint user widget and then we give it a name in this case let's just call it a uh, hot widget blueprint because it's going to be the heads up display things like our hp uh, maybe the level name or level number but most importantly for what we're doing right now is displaying our coin counts opening that up gives us this canvas where we can if we want to just like drag in a button and this will be a button but then we can't really do anything else with it and we don't really know what it appears like on screen and stuff like that so and since we want to display multiple different things and we want it to be the heads up display here we're going to first add a canvas this is a representation of your game screen so now that we have the canvas here we can uh, drag in a bit of text and we have a text block and we can put that wherever we want on the screen so we can put anything we want into this text block. So let's say uh, coins and then we'll say coins. But how do we actually display the number of coins we have? Because we can't very well make a separate text for coins zero, coins one, coins two, coins three, coins four, and so on and so forth. That just doesn't really work. Luckily, there is an easy solution for that. If you go over to this text, you can see this bind menu and we can create a new binding. And now we have a event graph looking thing. We've got a input node and an output node. So here we can put in some node trace to make the text whatever we want. So let's get that started. We are looking to get the coin value from our player character. So we can get player character and then we can use that to cast to blueprint third person character as we did in the coin the last episode as well so we use this as the object reference and then we can get the score value we made last time so now we have the actual number of coins that we have collected in this widget blueprint so now we need to combine that with a bit of text and put that into the return node over here so what you can do is adding a new node uh, called append and you're going to use the append string variation and this will allow you to add multiple strings together into one long string which will then be able to go into our return node so we can type something like uh coins into this first one adding a space 
because otherwise there will be no space between the colon and the actual number. And then we can just drag this into the B slot. Again, it will make an automatic conversion from integer to string. And we don't need the other two pins, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, then we can put that into here, which will also add a conversion node from string to text. There's very minute differences between using strings and using texts. By and large, if you just use a string, uh, Unreal will add these nodes where necessary. And this is everything there is to it. This will now display the amount of coins we have. But if we actually start up the game here, we will see no such thing. Not at all. And that is because we haven't actually added that overlay to our gameplay yet. So if we go back to our third person character, you can do this in a lot of different places. Let's do it in the character for now, because that's what we've been working in so far. We can uh, add a begin play event. And then we can say create widgets. With that, we can choose a class. We only have one widget class, so that'll create a widget reference for us. Now, the output here is a construct object reference, and we can just simply add to viewports. Hook that up into there. And now, when we start a game, you will see we have a coin counter, which will automatically count up as we collect coins. It really is as easy as that. Now, if you also have an HP value, you do the exact same thing. You make a text here. You can go back into the designer by pressing this designer button over here. So we can just down here, copy and paste to make a clone of this coins text. Then in bindings, we can say create new binding again. And let's say in the character here, we also have an HP value, which we can uh, make into an integer. We can just copy this entire thing from get text one and paste it in here. Hook this up. Change this uh, note here from get score to get HP. And then, of course, change uh, this little bit of text here to HP as well. Now, you will notice that this still says coins, and that's because that's the text we've given it. The moment the actual gameplay starts, the binding will take over and it will display HP. For a little bit of clarity, I like to make the HP a, a green color and then the coins something more like a golden yellow color, which is very easily done like this. Maybe make it a bit more orange to differentiate the two. And let's give the HP value a default of five. And now you can see we've got HP and we've got coins. There's a lot more here to explore, but for the time being, these are the basics of making a UI element. If you know something about working in Photoshop or GIMP or whatever, something like that, you're probably going to pick up this editor pretty quickly. I mean, we've got color and opacity, we've got fonts, we've got uh, shadow colors and offsets and all that kind of stuff, which you're probably used to if you have done any graphic work whatsoever at all. As a little bit of a bonus here, we're going to add in a button under this, which is going to reset the level. So we can drag in that button. Then if we drag some text on top of the button, it will actually stick itself inside of the button. And now if we move the button itself, the text will also move with it, which is a very nice thing to have. For this text, we're not going to have to make a binding because it's just going to say reset. And then if we select this button and we go up into the event graph here, we'll want to be in the actual event graph, not in one of these functions that were created for us. And we can see a pre-construct event, event constructs, and event tick. Event construct is like begin play, but for the construction of the UI element. Pre-construct runs before event construct. So if there's things that need to happen before the thing even gets put on screen, you want to put it in event pre-construct. This is going to fire the frame it gets added to your screen. And then of course, event tick will run every frame. But with the button that we've just made selected, we see down here, we've got a couple of options on different events that we can add on clicked, on pressed, on released, on hovered or on unhovered. So we're going to go with the on clicked event. The difference between on clicked and on pressed is clicking is pressing down and releasing on the same button. You can do it on press, which will trigger the moment you press down on the button. You can do on released, which will happen the moment you release while hovering over a button. On clicked requires you to already be on the button, press down and still be on the button when you release, if that makes any sense. 
And if it doesn't make sense, just remember, 9 times out of 10, you want to use unclicked. So we're going to make that, and we're going to get an event unclicked for that button. Then we can drag over this and say open level by name. And if we want this to be a reset, there's a really easy way to make this work on every level because you need to implement the level name. But of course, there is a note for that, and that is get current level name, which will just get the name of the currently played level and give it to us. And then we can hook that up into there again with an automatic conversion node. So now if we press this button, the level will reload. So we can play, but I don't have a cursor at the moment, which is slightly annoying. In the editor itself, if you press Shift F1, you will get your cursor back. And then if you click on the actual gameplay, your cursor will disappear again. So Shift F1, we get our cursor, we can press the button and it reloads the level. And with that basic knowledge, I would give you a little bit of homework before moving on to the next video. And that is make a object which will prompt you with a end level screen that will allow you to replay the level at the end of your actual level. Next time, we're going to get a little bit more into the designing of the actual level and making the game just a little bit more fun to play. When we last left off, we made our first interface bits here we've got a little coin counter a little hp counter and we've got a button to reset but the level we have still kind of sucks right we only have one straight bit here uh we can walk left and right we can jump obviously and that's it so we're going to make a couple more adjustments to this level We've already talked about being able to go into brush editing mode here and use that to change up your levels a little bit. So we can say extrude here. And then when we extrude this, we can make a new face and then going back into edit mode, we can make a little bit of a ramp here, going back into extrude mode, and we can just keep going like this as long as we want to and this still isn't all too interesting right so now if we go back into uh, select mode we can copy this entire box brush over going back into the outline here you will see there's a second box brush now and we can move that along the y axis a little bit here and we'll see that now we have created a jump but still this is all very static we want a moving platform so after we've done this entire thing twice we can maybe go into this and say brush editing and maybe say that we want to instead of going up we want to go down here so the best way to do that is changing your perspective to top perspective and finding the actor that you were working on the reason we go to top perspective is that it's easier to do this with a uh, box click and drag and then when we go back into perspective mode we have these points here selected and can drag them all down and now suddenly this is a very different shape and we can maybe put some enemies on here at some points but for the time being uh we're going to add in some moving platforms so going back into selecting mode here we can go into place actors and under shapes let's just put in a cube for the time being let's make it a little bit bigger this seems about right and we're going to make this cube move back and forth just very easy but once you understand how to make it move from left to right you can make it move in so many different ways and it's going to be a lot of fun to play around with so we're going to go into our content browser and we're going to make yet a new folder again folders not really necessary but you want to really keep your work tidy and make the folder called um sequences and inside that folder we're going to make a new animation level sequence and we'll call this um block movements We'll drag that into the level itself here. You can drag it anywhere into the level. Generally, it's good to put these things at the location of where the objects it's going to interact with are located. So in this case, we have the level sequence uh, on top of this cube over here. Now, if we double click this, we'll get a timeline. And in this timeline, we can start adding actors. So we can say, uh, add a track, actor to sequence, and then we can choose whichever actor we want. 
But we can also, with the outliner open, just drag and drop an actor from there into here. And now we have that added to this sequencer. So we've got by default some transform information, location, rotation, scale. We're going to only worry about the location here. More specifically, it's only going to be the Y location. So you're going to press on this button over here, which adds a new keyframe. If you've done anything with video editing or motion graphics or that kind of stuff before, you'll know all about keyframes. If not, it's really not that complicated. So we've got a keyframe at frame zero, right? So if we then tell our playhead at frame 120 and we move the block over here and make a new keyframe there as well, you will see that every frame in between frame zero and frame 120 will automatically get calculated. So halfway through at frame 60, it's halfway through the movement. Of course, it also needs to move back. So we're gonna go all the way to frame 240 here and just copy and paste the first keyframe. Then this red line over here, we also need to drag all the way to frame 240 because that shows where the animation stops. So now we can just press play and we can see that our block moves back and forward. You will notice that it has a little bit of easing, as it's called, at the beginning and the end, where it starts moving slower and it comes to a stop a little bit slower than the actual like movement speed of the thing. If you press this button here, show the animation keys in a curve editor, we will get a new window opening up. For me, it's on the other screen, so I'll just put it in here real quick. And you can see that this is the same information, but displayed in a curve. And we can actually mess around with that curve a little bit. So what I'll do now is it will go way past the actual Y value that we've given it, because this curve goes much higher than this keyframe. Uh, indicates and then we'll come back so with just a few keyframes you can make a lot of very complex movement using curves and just to show you what that looks like it moves all the way over there then it bounces back and we go back to the start so in a general sense for what we're doing here it is often we don't need to curve sequence or anymore uh, it's often a good idea to have that little bit of easing at the beginning and the end of your animation because that's where the player is going to jump on and jump off of the block you definitely want those moments to be a little bit more accessible and then when the block is moving the block is moving and that's just fine so now we can say okay we're at frame 120 let's select this actor um copy and paste it move this all the way around here as well and now we have made a new jump so now if we start playing the game you will see that first and foremost we have this little ramp that we made here then we've got our jump which might be yeah that's way too big so in your character movement component this is not too important for the tutorial uh, we're doing right now but i do want to show it we can uh, search up jump and the jump z velocity at the moment is 700 let's make that 1250 and suddenly we'll jump a hell of a lot higher and now we should be able to make that jump barely but we can make it then we have this uh second block that we have created which uh is very bare and very boring at the moment and then when we get here we don't see anything surely that's just because the block is still moving right if we wait here for a second the uh, the, the block will come back to us well, I'm gonna tell you uh, that's definitely not the case. Because what we need to do is in our animation uh, sequence here, first and foremost, we need to set the looping to looping indefinitely because we want this thing to move back and forward pretty much forever. And we also need to enable autoplay. Now, if we find that this is too quick, we can always set the play rate to being lower instead of messing around with the keyframes themselves and we can also set a offset as to how far along it should start in the animation and now when we get to the end here we'll see eventually the block it's a, it's a bad block it's, bla it's a bad level design uh because we can't see where we actually end up landing uh that's mostly to do with the camera though so if we just change up the camera a little bit 
you will notice that this feels much more like a 2D platformer already with the way uh, the camera is much farther away. With a platformer, you don't really want the camera too close because you want to be able to look around you. What's happening? Where are the platforms? Where am I in relation to the platform? All that kind of stuff. So this camera is much better set up for the 2D platformer uh, as it is. And now we can see that when the block comes our way, uh, we, we need to make a little jump, and I, I just made that jump really, really badly. Uh, but things are significantly better. So, in this way, you could also animate its rotation, its uh, scale, you, you can literally animate everything about this. And this can go even further. You can actually use the sequencer to fire off events within Actors, if that's something that you want to do. And in a lot of cases, that can come in very, very useful. Though, that's a little bit beyond the scope of the basic tutorials that we're doing here. And that is the most basic, easiest, and most often used way that you will end up animating objects within your scene. You can do it purely through programming with blueprint scripts as well. That's overly complicated a lot of the time, though it does have its upside in being able to work quickly around with things. Maybe at some point I'll make a tutorial about how to do this with purely blueprints instead of using sequences, but for the time being right now, just stick with this. And next time we're going to be making some enemies and it'll really, really start turning into a game. To complete our Unreal Basics tutorials, we're going to make a simple enemy that will just walk back and forth between two points. So let's get started right away with that. And in our blueprints folder over here, we'll make a new blueprint and we'll make that a character because we're going to want a character that can walk from point A to point B. We'll call it uh, Enemy Blueprint. So let's give it a quick skeleton mesh and animation class. You'll be able to get more in depth with that in future videos, I'm sure. For right now, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, so we just have something to visualize the fact that we have an enemy walking somewhere. The important part is what we'll do with the script. So we'll start by making a new variable and we'll call that a walking point or something along those lines. And the variable type is going to be changed to being a actor and object reference. We're also going to change this from a variable type of just a single one to an array so it can hold multiple values. I'm not sure if we've gone over arrays yet, but an array is just one single variable that can hold multiple values within it. So as you can see over here, we have this one variable has a value for index 0, a value for index 1, a value for index 2, and so on and so forth. You can dynamically add indexes, take indexes away during gameplay. It's a very good way to deal with a lot of data. And then we're also going to make a variable uh, current target, which is also going to be a actor object reference, but this is going to be a single one. This is going to be the target that we're at that moment walking towards with this specific enemy. So at event begin play, we'll set the current target to being uh, equal to a walking point reference, which we can get from holding control and dragging. And then we'll uh, get a copy of index zero. So that's just number zero in the entire list that that array has. So our current target has a value. We'll then make a custom event and call it uh, walk to. In that, we will use move to location or actor, which is an AI navigation task. So firstly, we're going to uh, get the AI controller. And for that, we need a controlled actor, which is just the actor that we have here. So we can just get a reference to self. And then our goal is our current target. So holding control, we drag a reference into that. And then on move finished, we change what walking point we're walking towards. So for that, we're actually going to need another variable here. And we're going to call that index int, which is obviously going to be an integer variable. So after the move finishes here, we're going to uh, get a reference to our newly made index int. And we're going to type plus plus to get an increment integer. This will, as we've discussed before, increment this integer by one. Now we're going to do a little bit of trickery here. We're going to uh, copy over this reference to our array here, and we're going to get the last index here. So we're going to compare these two, and if 
this is larger than the last index that means we'll have to loop around otherwise we don't have to loop around and we can just pick the next index for our current target so we drag off this and we get a greater than node so if this new index int is greater than the last index this will either give a true or false output whether or not that's true we can then use that in this branch over here so if we plug this into the condition if that's true we'll execute this piece of code if that's false we'll execute that piece of code it's very important to hook up the previous node into it as well though so if this index integer is larger than the last index of this array, we're just going to want to set this index integer back to zero. It's as easy as that. And if it's false, we really don't need to do anything. So now we want to set our current target to something else. So again, we can just drag that in and get another reference to our array here. And then we can uh, get a copy and we'll get the copy corresponding to our index integer variable here and that will then be set to our new target we can just hook this straight up into there and this into there so now what will happen is we'll move to our first target location then when that move is finished our index integer will be incremented by one then if that exceeds our last index in our array which could be two three four five six whatever it will get reset back to zero so it loops back around if it's not greater than that it'll just leave it alone and we move on to setting our current target to the next one down the line and then we can just run this walk to events again and it will just keep looping of course we do also need to put the walk to event at begin play but this really is as easy as it is it's a little messy looking but it's a pretty easy script and it works wonderfully so now let's put the enemy blueprint uh, somewhere near the beginning of the level so we can easily test it so we put that guy uh, over here somewhere and now we need two actors for it to walk uh back and forth between so we can just make a simple actor uh, a normal one will do and we'll just call it empty and that we can use as just a reference point to get the transform location for those two points but now if we go into this details panel here we can't really like do anything and that's because over in the blueprint here we haven't set the walking points array to being public so if we set that to public and we go back into this having this enemy selected going into the details panel we'll now see this walking points array over here so we can add two array elements we can have a uh, little pick drop thing here meaning that we can pick this actor then pick this other actor so now one last thing we need to do is we need to actually place another thing over here because at this point this enemy ai can't actually walk in order for this enemy ai to be able to walk we're going to need a nav mesh so we can get this nav mesh bounce volume we place it on here and if you go up here into show you should see here navigation you can also enable it with p and that will show you this little green overlay that shows you what parts of your level are included in a nav mesh now we can make this bigger and we need to make this at least big enough for it to walk all the way over there and over there so now it has the nav mesh to be able to reach both of these things if you don't include that your character just won't be able to walk so now if we play the game you will see this enemy is moving back and forth between these two points and obviously it's a little rough right now it's also uh, not an enemy that we can kill in any meaningful way but by and large this is the basics of how it works and i also just killed myself now you can add a lot more scripts to this to kill it when it gets landed on when it gets stomped on by the by the player for instance 
you can add something like a projectile when the player gets in reach and all that kind of stuff. You can get really, really complicated with this. If you want to see more about AI walking around, I do have a mini series on making a shooting AI, which I would highly recommend you look into. This is just the very basics of working with the AI capabilities of the Unreal Engine. It's relatively easy, but it's also very powerful once you get into the slightly more complicated side of things. For now, I think I've given you all the tools you need to make a basic 2D platformer. So go wild, make whatever you want to make, and maybe take another look at some of the videos on the channel if you've got any questions.